At Lifetime Wealth Strategies, you know, we're stewards of our clients' money, but with regards to the strategies that we use and how we've helped our clients aspire to their dreams, we have to invest in our community as well. And so while we help our clients, we partner with the community. We believe that supporting Kentucky to the world and supporting the student program and providing groundwork for young people and, and the next generation to see the successes that come out of our community is a great way for us to invest back into the community and provide an inspiration for the next generation to come. Kentucky to the world is a wonderful way for us to have impact. And when we partner with organizations like Kentucky to the world, we see that impact through things such as the student program that we're sponsors of. There are as many as 50 young children at this event that are gonna see that they are the future. Greetings from the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I'm Addison Shaney. And I'm Caden Mulroney. On behalf of Atherton High School, thank you for joining us for the student program portion of Kentucky to the World's digital conversation featuring Dana Kennedy. Addie, what are we talking about tonight? We are living in an era where journalism has fallen prey to sensationalism, clickbait, and misinformation that continues to threaten the crucial role the institution plays in holding the powerful accountable. Kentucky to the World, a local nonprofit dedicated to changing the reputation of Kentucky and her citizens in the eyes of the world, knew that it was time to invite Dana Kennedy to be a featured speaker in the first digital installment of their ongoing Republic Bank Foundation series. A graduate of the University of Kentucky, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and former administrator of their awards, author and current publisher at Simon & Schuster, Ms. Kennedy is joined here by career journal editor Rick Green to answer some questions from students just like us. Let's get into it. First up, we have 14-year-old Leo Toby from Manuel High School with a question for Dana Kennedy about the implications of the media coverage of the Breonna Taylor case, both nationally and locally, as well as the issue of confirmation bias within modern media. Hi, my name is Leo Toby. I am 14 years old and I'm a freshman at DuPont Manual High School. And I spent the past two years as a Scholastic Kids Press reporter. Uh, in this role, I ran into several t troubling issues, uh, two of which I would like your thoughts on. First, as you can see, I am here at Jefferson Square in Louisville. This site has become the Justice Organizing and Memorial Epicenter in response to the killing of Breonna Taylor. I have been troubled by the national coverage of Brianna's death. The coverage is often myopic and amidst the nuance that local journalists bring to such an important story. How can we do better in the promotion and circulation of local journalism, especially on stories as important as Brianna's? Second, it seems that readers are increasingly seeking information that confirms rather than challenges their biases. AI algorithms compound this, bringing readers, publications, and articles likely to do the same. How do we combat the AI algorithms that drive people to new sources likely to confirm their existing biases? First of all, I wasn't thinking like that at 14. So this young man, Leo, you are the future. And good for you. If, if, if we have a million Leos going into journalism, we're going to be just fine in answer to your early question about the future of journalism. As it relates to the Breonna to uh, Taylor story, such a tragic story and such a tragic situation because I know for her family it's not a story. It's actually their, their life and their loved one and, and their, their, their pain. Uh, I think that most reputable news organizations are doing the best they can to get it right and are mostly getting it right. I do believe that. I think we all see the coverage through our own lens. The hope is that um, this segues into the second part of, of the question, which is that people are reading from a diverse range of sources uh, and newspaper sources so that they can get varying perspectives on the coverage. In general, not related to this specific case, I believe it's important to uh, not simply read or watch the the news that's going to enforce you reinforce your values so i make it a habit of of looking at cnn fox news and msnbc because you can't really understand what people are thinking unless you're get out of your echo chamber where you're not just having your own views reinforced it's a hard thing to do especially if you get frustrated listening to the folks who don't agree with you and that that's for all of us regardless of your point of view it's really frustrating when you think fundamentally you are right and can't understand why someone else is coming from a different perspective but taking the time periodically 
to read uh, something or listen to something that's completely counter to your view um, uh, helps, I think, understand other people, but also informs how you see things. And if you're a journalist or a budding journalist like this one, how you write about stories and the kind of sourcing that you use for your stories. I think we're increasingly worried about the um, the closing of so many different newspapers. Oh, gosh, yes. about the echo chambers, but when you're talking about the closing around the country of hundreds and hundreds of newsrooms and news sites um, and being replaced by content aggregators mm -hmm. and the echo chambers, how do you feel about the, the emergence of these news deserts that are happening across the country? Well, you're exactly right. And in fact, you remind me that that should have been part of my answer to your earlier question about journalism. It's the biggest threat to a journalism in this country. A uh, huge threat. I mean, there were times, as you know, when there were two newspaper towns where you had a morning newspaper and an afternoon newspaper, and they competed and kept each other honest. You know, um, uh, and now you're, you're seeing cities that don't even have one. And I fear we'll have regions where you, you don't have a, a, a good newspaper. The national press is, is tried to fill that void, but they're not on the ground. We're boots on the ground in these cities. And that's, that's a risk, you know, to have, to have a news organization like the New York Times, where I worked, parachute into a town, stay for a week or two or even a month and leave, um, doesn't allow you to do the sourcing that you need to really get to the heart of stories. So that is one of the biggest threats to journalism. I think what may help is models like the ProPublica, um, where there are partnerships, where newspapers pull their resources and to, 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 to be able to tell a, a big story and, and uh, devote uh, more resources than they would have on their own. I think you're going to find more news organizations become foundations and, and, and get donor money to keep going and that, but there's a slippery slope there because with that comes the threat of influence by whoever's funding those organizations. It's not an easy problem and the, and the entire industry is grappling with it right now. Yeah. Great advice from Ms. Kennedy about seeking out different perspectives on current issues by looking at the news through multiple sources. It's definitely something that we all struggle with, but it's essential in this age of modern media. Next up, we have a question from Allison Warner-Smith, a recent political science graduate about finding balance between publishing innovative and groundbreaking work while also having to abide by the structure of traditional journalism. Hello, Ms. Kennedy. My name is Allison Warner-Smith and I'm a graduate student at the University of Louisville studying political science with a concentration in digital politics. I now work, live, and study here in Louisville, but I grew up in rural Henry County, Kentucky, about 30 miles outside of downtown. Today, I come to you from the comfort of my home office, where you can imagine I'm spending the majority of my time. Thank you so much for taking my question, and I look forward to hearing your response. I actually have a two-part question today. First, how did you find a balance between writing and publishing new and at times groundbreaking work with having to operate within the norm and rigidity of traditional journalism and media? Along with that, what advice do you have to young Kentuckians entering a tumultuous job market that are looking to find that balance as well? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So I didn't. I never found it rigid at all. I I think that um, this young lady may find, as she really gets into the business, that it isn't rigid. Um, um, you know, as a journalist, you get to you get to walk into other people's lives and explore. And really, any situation that's impactful and that has um, uh, where there's a story to tell, whether it's politics or religion or, uh, uh, you know, personal narratives. Um, there are so many stories, you know, uncovering wrongdoing. Um, um, there are so many stories to tell that I think most news organizations are looking for journalists who are curious, well-trained, come with, with, with not a preconceived notion of the news and really, really, can develop a beat and a specialty. Uh, and in the case of people who are general assignment reporters are open to wherever the story may take them. But I actually fundamentally don't think that journalism, traditional journalism is rigid at all. I never found that. I was able to spend a day in prison with a murderer. I, after covering his trial, I wanted to know what made this man do this? He just, you know, how, he was such an interesting figure that I had to understand how did he become a murderer? You know, I spent four days on an Amish farm uh, writing about the Amish as a black woman from, you know, Kentucky. Um, um, uh, journalism has taken me to some of the most prestigious places in the country and to the, some of the most devastating, you know, standing beside a river when a man's son was being pulled out after having drowned and I was writing about his story. So 
I think journalism is, is anything but rigid. And I do think that your career can take you anywhere you want to go. Now, one last thing about this is that there are all kinds of new platforms that didn't exist when I started out. And so someone like this young lady can create, if she, if she believes there's a need or there's a niche that's not being filled, can create the model for filling that niche. Uh, I think the industry in the country is, is, is in a time of innovation. And that benefits people like this who may have new approaches to storytelling, new approaches to journalism. So let's talk a little bit about that for a second. When I was an editor in Des Moines at the Register, um, doing a lot of recruiting for those interns that you talked about. And I remember an interviewer came across the table from me um, in his best you know, suit and tie and, and telling me, I'm ready to be a, a reporter on your staff because I understand social media. I have 5,000 followers on Twitter. I know how to shoot video and how to edit video. I know how to take photos. Uh, I interact with sources on Facebook. And I, you know, all of these skills have made me prepared to be a, to be a reporter for your staff. And I remember sitting back and acknowledging, you know, that's really great and a strong understanding of social and multimedia, but how do you develop sources that will tell you things that they're not supposed to tell you? Mm -hmm. How do you know where to file the public records request and what data that you're seeking in the public records that you're trying to pursue? How do you develop this network of sources that are going to mm -hmm. give you that competitive edge? And, and so I'm curious from your standpoint, Dana, and your years of experience, you talk about just the new ways of storytelling, which is fabulous, but what about that tried and true, the X's and the O's and the exactly right. of this business? How important is that for one of these? It's, it's the people? most important thing, and it's, it's a great question. Thank you. Because if you don't have that, if you don't know where to do the things you just talked about, it doesn't matter what platform you have. Right. Right. That's where it all falls apart. There are no shortcuts for the basics. You have to master and own those first. You know, um, how to source. That's not an easy thing to do. Just because you're interacting with somebody on Twitter, on Facebook, doesn't make them a source. And it doesn't mean when you, there's information they really have that there's a risk in them giving to you that they're going to trust you enough to do that, right? Yeah. Um, you do need to know if somebody's telling you something, where to go find those documents and verify that information or uncover it. Um, um, everything stems from the basics. And by the way, and I'm sure you, you, you know this as well, it doesn't matter what your profession is, whether it's law, medicine, journalism, you start with the basics. And I, 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 I thank you for reminding me this. I always say this to students. You got to own your profession and your craft and build up goodwill and credibility with your colleagues and your bosses before you can innovate and do anything else. I like repeatedly, time after time, you have to, it doesn't mean don't make mistakes. I have I made some big ones. But time after time after time, you have to keep getting it right, digging deeper, working and not looking for shortcuts and corners and producing stellar work. Especially if you're a woman and a person of color, like you're not gonna get past the first or second tier until you perform over and over and over at a really high, high level. Great, great. And it starts great. with the basics. You bet, absolutely, those X's and O's. Understand yeah. the fundamentals and then build upon them. Right. Absolutely. At the end of the day, all we have left is credibility. And if mm -hmm. we don't, you know, don't have that, then I don't think we have much of a career. Do you agree? That's right. I completely agree. If you're thinking about getting into the field of journalism, I hope you are taking notes on that great career direction from Miss Kennedy. Definitely. We all have to start somewhere and learning and mastering the basics is fundamental to any good career. Last but not least, we have a question from Lauren Thompson about how a military background affected Dana's career path and character, as well as the significance of becoming the first African-American to head a major publishing imprint and the responsibilities of this role. Hi, Ms. Kennedy. My name is Lauren Thompson. I'm a Lincoln Scholar and Ambassador, and today I prepared three questions to ask you. My first question is, how did being raised in a military family affect your career path and the woman you've chosen to become today? Second. What emotions sprung into action when you found out you were going to be the first African-American woman to head a major publishing imprint? And do you feel a certain responsibility? And lastly, what is the main theme or lesson in the book, How Race Has Lived in America, which you're the co-author of, that ultimately led it to win a Pulitzer Prize in 2001? Thank you. Okay. So first of all, growing up in a mil military family um, instilled a sense of discipline and an and, and order in my life that I needed. Um, um, you know, people in the military have a kind of prescribed way 
of doing things that means you have to take care of, again, going back to the basics, there's just certain things you have to check off your to-do list and there's just no way around that. And so having that sense of order and people who were, and, and being raised by people who were purpose-driven um, helped me to stay focused. As it relates to being the first um, African American, or American um, to head this publishing company, and, and by the way, to head any of the major publishing houses, I've been a lot of firsts in my career, uh, a lot. I don't put much weight on that. I know that their re responsibility comes with it and I honor that responsibility. My number one responsibility to Simon Schuster is to be a good publisher period of any color and any gender, like to be a good publisher overall. Within that mandate, if I can expand and I will, you know, the audiences that we reach, or the, the readers that we speak to, um, diversify our staff, then I will be doing that. But the number one thing I have to do is to, um, to lead this 90 year old, very storied uh, publishing house, um, you know, regardless of my race and gender. And so that's what I will be doing. And that's what I've done my career. I wasn't, I wasn't a really good black journalist at the New York Times. I was a really good journalist at the New York Times. Outstanding. You know, I'm sitting here over the last 50 minutes or so thinking, God, I'm, I'm so inspired. And I know we have the magic and mystery of technology that's separating us here. And, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of your honesty and your transparency. I'm, I'm thinking about your personal life and the mentor that or mentors that you have had that have inspired you. Mm -hmm. Can you share, particularly with these students, um, a lesson that you learned uh, at a young age from a mentor that has helped define your career, has helped define you as a person and your work mm -hmm. ethic, um, and has helped you on this path of success? Well, one of them was my father in the sense that um, I watched him. He was a drill sergeant. And he would get up four or five in the morning to go and work. And we had, there were five kids growing up in my family at that time. And um, my mother didn't work. We didn't have a lot of money. Um, and I learned work ethic from him. And I, I, I learned it by watching him. He would get up early and go to work. And then uh, at night, he would work uh, driving a taxi to make more money. And then on the weekends, he worked at a movie theater. And he'd bring us these big tubs of the leftover popcorn home, you know, in those big bags. Um, but to work that hard, we were able to buy a brand new home that nobody had ever lived in. We had great Christmases. I don't know how they filled up under that tree every year, but they did, my parents. And my mother, as well, who was the PTA president, she dropped out of high school, but went back and got her GED and then got um, um, an associate's degree in college and always stressed education to us and was the PTA president in our town. And so um, that set me up for, huh, Number one, this is what is expected of me to work hard, to value education, and, and from there, everything flowed. That's awesome. My last question, and I, it's a very personal one, and I hope you'll share it with us. Sure. Um, at some point in our lives, our careers end, and we move on to the next chapter of our, our personal mm -hmm. and our, I guess, post-professional lives. How do you want Kentucky to remember Dana Kennedy? Oh my gosh. Wow. You know, I, I'm a little uncomfortable answering that only in that I don't spend a lot of time thinking of myself like that. Do you know, like I'd be grateful if anybody remembers me at all. Um, my mom said to me, she said to me a few times, how does it feel to be famous? And I was like, mom, if you have to tell people you're famous, you ain't famous. <laughs> so I don't spend a lot of time on that. I, you know, I tell my son, I am too clumsy to have my head in the air. Like if I had my nose in the air and tried to be so snooty and all that, I'd fall because I'm clumsy. Um, I just do my work and I want to do God's will. And if I'm remembered, I hope that's what I'm remembered for. Uh, I don't take myself seriously. I take what I do seriously. So I haven't actually ever thought of that. I just, I suppose I'd want to just be remembered as somebody who was, you know, who worked hard, who tried to do God's will through her work and was a good mother, friend, sister, colleague. That's it. I don't need any more than that. That's awesome. And that's a great answer. <laughs> Dana Kennedy, it was a great pleasure being with you tonight. Thank you awesome. so much for your, a chance to show your soul and to be transparent with us and to get us a, a, a little bit into both your heart as well as your mind. It's been a great honor. So thank you so very much. My honor as well. Thank you so much. You bet. <laughs>
I love when she said she was never a good journalist based on a certain part of her identity, but that she was a good journalist because of her extensive skill set. All the great advice she gave throughout the program helps a young journalist become a leading journalist of the next generation. With the rise of citizen journalism taking place across social media, we hope this conversation has inspired you to continue speaking out thoughtfully and responsibly to combat the misinformation disease to our democracy. Our generation will soon take control of the national conversation and it's up to us to learn from the experts that are rooted exactly where we are today in order to make a difference in the future. We want to thank Kentucky to the World and Lifetime Wealth Strategies for always giving students a space and a voice in these programs. To see more stories of excellence and to see where you can get involved next, visit KentuckyToTheWorld.org and follow them on social media at Kentucky to the World. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you for joining us for this program and a special thanks to all of our sponsors for their continued support of the artists, writers, thinkers, and game changers who are dedicated to changing the narrative of Kentucky on the world stage.